hardly ever talked about in agriculture, let alone in regenerative agriculture circles. The labor challenges. Around the world, millions of people are exploited to pick our table grapes, tomatoes, lettuces, peaches, etc., etc. We don't like to think about it, but unless we, quote unquote, fix the labor issue, we will never have enough skilled people working on regenerative diversified farms. We can't simply say, don't worry about it, robots will take care of it. Because, spoiler alert, they won't, and especially not in specialty crops like fruit trees and anything perennial. Learn more about this hidden issue and more importantly the potential of a venture studio in this space, building companies, building collaborative automation ag tech, not to replace farm workers, but to make their jobs less heavy. This is the Investing in Regenerative Agriculture and Food podcast, Investing as if the Planet Mattered, where we talk to the pioneers in the regenerative food and agriculture space to learn more on how to put our money to work to regenerate soil, people, local communities and ecosystems while making an appropriate and fair return. Why my focus on soil and regeneration? Because so many of the pressing issues we face today have their roots in how we treat our land and our sea, grow our food, what we eat, wear and consume. And it's time that we as investors, big and small, and consumers start paying much more attention to the dirt slash soil underneath our feet. To make it easy for fans to support our work, we launched our membership community. And so many of you have joined us as a member. Thank you. If our work created value for you, and if you have the means, and only if you have the means, consider joining us. Find out more on gumroad.com slash investing in Regen Ag. That is gumroad.com slash investing in Regen Ag or find the link below. Welcome to another episode. Today with the co-founder of Farmhand Ventures, a venture studio building companies redesigning the future of work in agriculture. Welcome, Connie. Thank you. Thanks for having me. And there's a lot to unpack already in that uh, little little title or little uh, subtitle, but uh, I always like to start with the question, you know, because you're, you're a regular listener of the show. What brought you to soil? And then, of course, what brought you specific to the labor issue in soil and in agriculture? But let's say, what, what brought you to agriculture and food to begin with? Sure. Okay, I'll, I'll step all the way back on this. And I'm going to talk maybe less about soil than like most of your guests, because my assumption is that almost everyone listening to this, like gets it, gets that soil really matters. Um, so first, if you did, don't, we have like 180 plus yeah, episodes yeah, to listen I, I to 185. Ideas. I think we're not. Yeah. <laughs> there are some, some, there's some great books and documentaries, but if you like, let's, let's all agree we're in, in this, in this room now and we, we know soil matters. It does definitely. And yeah, so for me, I got into ag because I love food. So I actually worked in restaurants. I debated doing the kind of culinary, um, career trajectory instead of, you know, college university. Um, but you know, grew up in the New York City suburbs. Um, My family has farmland in Iowa that we were very much absentee landowners. Um, But yeah, grew up in the burbs, so went to college, was was good, always good at math as a kid, so did engineer, studied engineering. Um, And I think that, and have also always been very motivated by conservation. Um, I'm I'm a big fan of the Bronx Zoo. Um, I just like was super nerdy about all that stuff as a young person. Um, and so I think the intersection of those things, right, caring about planetary confines, caring about food, um, both the quality of it and accessibility. Um, and, and part of the reason I did also didn't go into the just working in restaurants is as much fun as it is and as valuable as I think it is societally, um, I didn't want to just serve rich people all day. Um, and so that intersect that with engineering and boom, you get ag tech actually. Um, so I also, I basically, I, I took a series of kind of loosely thought out things that, that landed me early in the kind of ag tech venture capital movement. So I did this entrepreneurial fellowship program, um, after graduating college, um, called venture for America. Um, And that is how I ended up working, moving to St. Louis. So moving to the Midwest of the U.S., which if you had told me as a kid that I would ever live anywhere but like the Northeast or maybe Bay Area, I would have laughed at you. Um, And I am now a pretty big advocate for, um, yeah, everywhere else, actually. Almost everywhere is pretty darn interesting. Um, 
And so I ended up moving to St. Louis and being one of the early employees at the Yield Lab, which at the time was one of the first ag tech um, accelerators. Uh, it was an experiment at the time, and it's really grown and turned into an international family of impact venture capital funds investing exclusively in agri- agri-food technology. Um, so, you know, building that straight from the deep end um, was has been super influential and shaped how I've looked at things. Um, but another really key thing that so so I I came into agriculture really thinking about the sustainability side of food and the environment specifically as it relates to environmental stuff. I hadn't had at that time very much exposure to poverty, um, racism, um, all of these kind of socioeconomical, sociopolitical issues that are really, really real um, and actually that are super intertwined in our agri-food system, right? Um, and so now I've arrived, so, so still looking at the, okay, soil really matters. Scientifically, I'm a super science geek. I'm the kind of person who is going to read all of the long form peer reviewed articles and critique the methodology in those. Um, so that's why soil matters, right? It, it does. But how do you actually make that fit into the reality that is political and economic, um, you have to integrate people into that system. So I have kind of shifted my mindset into thinking about, wait, why do we have an agri-food system? We have it to serve- why do we? why do we have one that doesn't lead to great soil health if you want to take the geeky well, outcome? Well, sure, but okay, but then let's, 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 let's explore that a little bit further because I, I came into this thinking, okay, Monsanto, agribusiness, big corporates are the bad guys. But they're actually, it's much more nuanced than that. I don't, I don't know that I believe that at all. Um, I can see arguments for it, but I don't know that I believe it at all. Um, there's really big challenges right now. Da- I live in St. Louis still, down the street from me, specifically across the street. And like we have different red line neighborhoods. The food desert issue is extremely real. The access to fresh produce, nutrition, even to a dozen of eggs that is affordable, that challenge is not even close to being sort of addressed. And it's obviously tied to our agricultural systems, but less directly than like you might think, actually. The other side of that, that I... I have been exposed to through working on farms. So I have done a fair bit of woofing um, uh, in, in France and in Oregon. Uh, but then more uh, industrially, I've worked with a farmland investment fund uh, in Oregon, um, actually managing crews of uh, about 100 seasonal workers during blueberry and hemp harvest season. Um, and actually working with those people alongside them and supervising them and understanding the economic constraints that they face in their everyday life. And also like having done the the labor, like it's, I've worked in restaurants, that's hard, right? Working in farms, way harder, way harder. Physically, it's brutal. Yeah, it's physically draining. It's, it's mentally challenging. It's it like the, the, the unskilled work thing is total nonsense uh, because like, I like, there, no one moves faster than farm workers and it's totally skill-based. Like you feel like, yeah, yeah it's, it's very hard to pick lettuce very quickly, actually, without hurting yourself in the long run. Um, so, so all of this kind of exposure has shifted my thinking on, so soil matters, yes. But what matters more than soil, actually, is the people who are involved in the system and why does soil matter? And uh, to me, like people are just another animal on this kind of planet Earth, right? And so soil matters because it matters for us, actually. It matters for us to have biodiversity for all of the good reasons associated with that. Again, listen to a bunch of former episodes. But in order to address that issue, we have to look at people first. And we have to look at the people who are affected by agri-food systems, which are both the people working in that system from farm workers to landowners and farmers and everyone in between, 
And we have to look at the people who are served or not served by that system. Um, and so that is how I kind of arose at labor. Like, so, so I've been trying to kind of figure out how do you, how do you address the people element of the system um, in such a way that works for kind of everyone involved in this like regenerative ag movement, so to speak. Um, and I think the answer is by focusing on the labor element, which I would make a strong case for uh, it being the single biggest bottleneck to actually changing agricultural systems to be more regenerative, diverse, et cetera. And why, why is that? Is that like, is that blocking? Because we, we hear this constant move. Okay. We, we, we do much more with less. We, we have better, bigger machines. There's only 2% of the population or whatever percentage is, is involved in directly in agriculture. We know that's partly not true because there are massive uh, labor forces needed to pick a lot of things. And, and like you mentioned before, in brutal circumstances, very badly paid, um, under very, let's say high um doses of the chemicals the sun everything we we throw at them be because we want this very very cheap um uh, very cheap uh, very cheap food so it seems like an in incredible uh, difficult issue to to unpack is that let's start there but then why is that a limiting factor for for regen ag or for the things we we have discussed in all the other episodes like what's what's why is labor a limiting limiting factor to, to diversify or to, to change soil practices at the end or to change how we manage our land? Uh, a good question. A couple of answers. I'll start practically and then I'll go farther out into like a more radical vision. So practically, so from like more of a sustainable ag tech, almost everyone in the agricultural industry, no matter where you sit on the spectrum, can get on board with side. Adoption is not happening of novel agriculture technology as quickly as it needs to be happening if we want all of the invested dollars to result in positive outcomes, right? Why is that? I am fairly certain that a big component of that is because the technology is not being designed for the user. It's kind of that simple. Um, and also there's a lack of appreciation for various incentives, often perverse incentives, along the cut that the customer faces. So if you're selling to a farmer, you got to think about the landowner. If you're, and also if you're selling to a farmer, a product that makes the farm workers job easier, you need to realize that probably that farmer, that farmer might be thinking about retaining that farm worker, but because of various structures that are in place. So I'll, talk about the US specifically here, but this is actually true in most countries. When you look at the history of labor and agriculture, starts with slavery. So that's not good. And that's still happening in other places in the world, by the way. Um, so it's and then it evolves into sharecropping. And it evolves into, also not good. It yes. evol and it has it's like current iteration is largely employing, but on a, on a contract basis, so without benefits, employing folks who have typically less than full citizenship rights, probably have some language barriers, probably are different ethnicities than the majority in that region, and are therefore very easily exploited. And so that is the group of people who gets the fresh food and the weeds and the prune, like gets all of the stuff done on farms and that group of people has a very limited voice in what we're actually designing to make that farm system more efficient. Especially from a technology perspective, I don't think and anybody building, I would say almost any ag tech, maybe 99 out of 100 has ever taken a farm worker. Like already you did really well if you did long interviews with farmers. But if you, or maybe you landowners, maybe to understand that kind of incentive structure and, and what is needed, et cetera. But I've yet to hear somebody who says, no, I really, I went in the field. First of all, I went to, to harvest these melons. And then we figured out this is this technology to, to help or to, and even what does help there mean? So you're saying, uh, unless we like acknowledge that there is a massive, extremely exploited, in most cases, extremely easily exploited labor force underpinning this ag system, 
we're never going to design solutions, let alone technologies that actually serve or fix something. Yeah, exactly. And then if you get, then take it a step further and say, okay, in regenerative agriculture, what do we want to see? We want to see fewer chemicals. What's the alternative to herbicides? Manual weeding, more labor. We want to see greater diversity of crops, so more rotation, less monoculture. How do you mechanize something that's constantly changing? How do you fully automate that? It's technically very difficult and expensive. We want to see more, like all of these things that we want to see more of in regenerative require systems hands. require more hands on the job. And so I think that, you know, in, in, in my utopic future, I yeah, because that's the question, like, how would that be then? Is there a space, let's say, let's say, or have you seen farms at scale that sort of provide that year round job, first of all, enough benefits, et cetera, that you can actually hire somebody properly, retain somebody, train, et cetera. And like, do these systems provide that kind of, um, margins or returns or whatever we want to call it to, to provide that and make sure somebody like this large labor force is not moving constantly from one region to another to pick X and then Y and Z and then rotates back sort of like a big migration, but a very bad one. Yeah. I mean, well, the, the other element of this, of course, is economics, right? Like you need that. And I want it like, this is a very, the reason people don't pay a lot of attention to ag labor is it's such a political hot button issue and it gets messy and it's human based. So it's hard but which is also the reason I want to try to do what I can in it. Um, but thinking about the farmer, right? Because I, I have spent a lot of time trying to work with and learn from farmers. And there is a very wide spectrum in terms of farmer quality. Um, and yeah, without getting into all sorts of like land inheritance issues there, um, there are a lot of really good farmers, right? Farms need to be sustainable businesses. And by sustainable, I mean economically sustainable businesses. And it needs to be run like cost, a business, yeah. Yeah, and the challenge that's happening right now, and like this is why I'm doing what I'm doing right now, the cost of labor is increasing faster than the inflation, you know, in, food costs is, is trickling down to farmers' rev, revenue, right? So... Bottom line is increasing. Top line is barely increasing. And that creates a problem. And so you've got situations where today it no longer makes economic sense to harvest certain crops. Like you look at asparagus in the UK. Strawberries are getting a lot of attention right now. Um, but the other, the other part of that, the other part of that is the waste side of things. So it doesn't make sense to harvest slightly lower quality crops or, and this becomes the challenge with having hyper-concentrated single crop systems in one region, what you end up having is a maturity of, and ripe, you know, everything is, all the blueberries are ripe the same couple of weeks, right? And so that packer who all those farmers have to sell those blueberries to can drive down the price during those weeks when they're actually in season. And so there's all these really complex pricing demand dynamics at play. So it makes it really hard, actually, in my mind, to get to a lot of these idealistic, regenerative, kind of even permaculture Utopians, incorporating yeah. type agricultural systems. I think that the only way to do that is through integrating some component of automation. But when I say automation, to be very clear, I don't mean a human free system. Robotics take over everything, but that's the solution, right? We just unleash the drones and, and we'll be yeah, fine. Right. Just let the robots take over. Wally will do it. Um, but no, I mean, that's not, that's not going to like, also like, I'm not a great engineer. I only studied engineering academically. I've been in finance most of the time, but like, I know enough to be like, yeah, like if chance when, when systems are completely economically infeasible, like, that's cool. That's a fun problem to solve. That is not a good investment for anyone. And so what, I'm, what I think we're starting to see, actually, as people are starting to realize that this labor crisis is, is in fact a crisis, 
And it's, it's interesting. It's not going away. It's, it's getting worse. It's, it's getting it's, worse. It's a thing. It's a thing. It's not that magically next year. Yeah. Prices it's will all, dramatically go down. Get worse. Yeah. When you like, we can, I can do a whole kind of seminar on all of the macroeconomic trends that are changing. And this is going to, you know, it's, it ends up, it is geographically specific. Like if you look at the U.S. context, Mexico birth rates are declining. So immigration, immigration rates are declining. That matters because the majority of the agricultural workforce in the U.S., it, uh, seasonal workforce in the U.S. is Mexican at this moment. Um, but you look at like what we're trying to do in terms of workforce modernization and some things seem to be stuck um, from a legislative standpoint. Um, and uh, yeah, so, so there's no relief in sight from, from and, and the, the other really big challenge here is this is where like often I think in these regenerative conversations, we talk about increasing food prices, right? If we increase food prices, the people who pick our food can't afford food. And, and they probably already can't. Yeah, they already can't, actually. A, a big chunk of it, yeah. Yeah, right. And so what kind of, when you say automation, collaborative automation, what is that? What are examples? Like, yeah. Walk us through visually, because, of course, we're in, in an audio podcast. Like, what, what, would, what, are, what are things out there already that would make some people, let's say, think differently about ag tech? And robotics, because I know many people were cringe listening to this and listening to like technology is going to save us, but there, there's a very important role there. But what do you mean when you say collaborative uh, automation? So I actually mostly right now for the next five years or so mean the stupid kind of technology. And I'll explain what I mean by that. So one of our uh, studio portfolio companies uh, is a company called Future Acres. And what Future Acres does is it mechanizes fresh crop transport. So what does that really mean? Today, if, if you're harvesting table grapes, right, the workers will pick table grapes manually, clip them, put them in the wagon. When the wagon is full, they take the wagon to the central waste station. Then they go back into the row, keep picking. You waste 30 to 40% of your time walking back and forth with loads of grapes. If you had a with with Future Acres product, carry, the wheelbarrow says, Hey, I'm getting kind of heavy over here. Please come pick up the grapes. And so a little wagon comes over. Worker just has to load the grapes onto that wagon. Wagon goes back to Central Way Station. That becomes very interesting also from a data capture future opportunities perspective. But from a like in this moment, solve a problem now perspective you are not displacing the people doing the hard, like it is, it's actually technically very difficult to pick table grapes in particular. Like that's a really complicated um, geometry to deal with, right? Um, no robotic arm will do that very soon at any kind of scale or level we can imagine. <laughs> yeah, well, may, may, right. maybe, 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 maybe. But, yeah. um, but the, the challenge really becomes vision and again, it becomes the diversity of fields because I, I, so I mentioned table grapes for that example, because Future Acres is, that's their first kind of addressable market. Um, but what's interesting about that Future Acres model is it scales across crops, which is something that is really unusual in the world of agricultural automation. And even when you look at, U.S. table grapes are interesting. They're relatively uniform as a crop, but I know blueberries very well, right? So when I look, I can tell you why we had different management practices across three different farms, essentially, within two different counties in the same region in Oregon. And each field was slightly different. And those differences present a challenge and an additional cost for scaling any kind of vision solution, right? And so this is, and this is a problem that's important to point out in the context of agricultural robotics, because, and this gets into the whole kind of capital stack side of everything. It is very expensive and because it's technically difficult to scale most very specific automated solutions across different crop types. It's expensive even to do it across regions and different fields, 
And it just gets even worse when you try to do it across different crops. And that's a really big problem in my mind, because I usually sit on the capital allocation side of things in the venture capital world, right? And you need that scale. You need that, that, you need that applicability scale. because otherwise you're limited to or a very small crop and well, does a very small time of year. A very small crop very, across a long time period, actually. Yeah. And you end up with a situation where everyone's harvesting at the same time. So you can't you know, effectively ship your robots to be used at different points in time in the year. Um, and so how, do you, how do you get over that? Like why, if it, that's such a specific... Simple, issue. And, and this is where Farmhand Ventures is interested. So there's two different ways to do simple it. Simple solutions, stupid simple solutions. Stupid simple like, solutions. Yeah. But there's two ways to do it. There's either, actually, it's not either, it's both. Both stupid simple solutions, those are the things that will scale across crops, multiple types of crops, and being pragmatic and realistic. And so what I think we need is to invest in many solutions that are. 95 to 99 percent technically identical but with that five one to five percent on top that makes it crop specific and that one to five percent might be pretty costly and so that's where it's very important to really understand the total addressable market that that technology realistically can address and so at farmhand ventures that's kind of what we're thinking about when we build companies we are looking for opportunities that are crop specific, actually. And we realize that in doing so, we are actually limiting our total addressable market for some of these solutions. And that can actually be okay, because then if you step back outside of robotics even, and you say, okay, again, from a venture capital standpoint, what, what, what do exits look like in ag tech right now? They're generally, they're, they're very few billion dollar exits. There aren't many unicorns. They're generally acquisitions. And in fact, they're generally under a hundred million in terms of successful exits even. Um, maybe you could say like the Blue River 305 million is like the top most for like agrobotics probably that has happened. And like arguably that, that probably won't happen again for some time. That was a pretty high valuation for that. Um, and so then I sit back again as a you know, fund manager type person um, who likes math um, and say, all right, well, how can I deliver effective, how can we as an investment community even put capital towards solutions that will have a positive impact and make money off of them? And we totally can. But one thing that's really important to do in doing that is being realistic and pragmatic about what the likely end scenario is, because then you have to reverse engineer and say, okay, how can I structure an investment entity such that it, I either have a large enough ownership percentage or I am doing alternative mechanisms for investment, such as revenue based investment, as opposed to pure equity based. Um, and like, I, that that is something I can talk all day about because like I, we need so much more of that to invest in the things that actually solve the problems in agri-food systems. And and to just double click, I mean, there's a lot to unpack there on the studio model, obviously. But to unpack uh, to um, double click on this the, the the stupid solution for table grapes, like how does that trajectory look like? Is it going to be um, then other types of grapes, is it going to be really specific? Is the table grape industry big enough to support a good exit company, let's say, or is it going to go to, I just mentioned the blueberry side or the peaches side? Like how have you planned? Obviously we have to look how that actually uh, plays out, but how have you planned that trajectory for, for that, uh, for that company? Okay, I'm going to do a weird thing and give kind of like a shout out to competitors to that company because like Burrow is arguably is like is the first mover in the U.S. in in this space. They have a sort of similar platform. It's a bit different technically, um, but there I and I mentioned them and there's a couple of newcomers, actually a bunch in the EU right now who are very early stage um, that are again addressing the crop transport uh, crop transport problem um in the field yeah. right in the field and that's a problem across every crop i think that there will be multiple there is space for multiple solutions to generate substantial revenue in that across multiple crops 
One question I think that all of these companies and Future Acres is an early stage company. Um, so so I uh, will see where we go on this. Um, but one question is, do you focus on verticalizing kind of within one crop and actually saying, OK, we can do these things for table grape growers. We can we are in a very we are very well positioned to capture this extra data that can then enable us to do these other things kind of further down the supply chain of the table grape or up. Um, do you focus on that and do you expand your uh, revenue opportunity, revenue base just within table grapes? Or do you say, okay, actually we can just dump a fleet of these robots with a very minor adjustment into stone fruit, into Pinot. So the some, some, some wine grapes, not most, most are mechanically harvested already. Um, and, and into, you know, blueberries and other soft fruits. Um, and that's a question. And I don't really know what the answer is yet. And we're deciding on that approach right now. And, and from a studio model, why did you choose the, the studio model to, instead of quote unquote, uh, raising an, an ag tech focused on the labor problem fund and, and just do seed and precede and, and, and go with, with that? Is that, like, well, what was the, what's the reasoning behind that? Apart from that, we have to see way more uh, experimentation also on the how to deploy capital and how to build company sites. I'm very happy with that. But what's the, re what's the reasoning behind it from, from your side, from the operating side? Um, a couple of things. So one on a value, purely values basis, right? I want to see more diversity. I want to see more, uh, a better spread of wealth. And I think one pathway to that is having greater socioeconomic diversity on the cap table, on, in, on an equity owner basis, right? And right now, it is incredibly difficult for someone who's not rich to afford to be able to take the risk of starting a company or being one of the first five employees at a fast growth company, right? That's, that's just not feasible for someone who doesn't have a cushion for the most part. Of course, there are some exceptions. The studio model, enables us to pay someone to work on a high risk venture and to actually bring them back in if and when that high risk venture fails, which is part of the reality of startups and to allocate them to another venture. So it is worth trying from a values basis, just on that premise to me. Way more inclusive. Basically. Way more inclusive. Way more exactly. accessible. Yeah. Exactly. Make startups accessible is a concise way to say that. Um, and also as when we look specifically at hardware in agriculture, we, I mean, that's tough. That's not a fit for most venture capital when you're saying it, it's a fit for some kind of deep tech models. But when you say I'm a venture capital fund and you have the option to invest in fintech software for ag versus agro robotics software for specialty crops. There's no way that as a VC fund manager with a set number of dollars to invest, I don't know how you justify investing in that collaborative robotics investment that's going to take longer, need more capital to bring to market and have a limited addressable market, relatively speaking. And also societally, we really, really need to invest in that stuff. Um, but I think that by having a very thesis specific studio and by creating a portfolio of companies that is actually somewhat collaborative. So I think that most people will look at farmhand venture, most people outside of agriculture will look at farmhand ventures portfolio and say, what the heck, they're invested in a bunch of competitors. But that's not at all because we'll have a blueberry company and a grape company and an apple company. And they're so different. And they're so vastly they're... different. But at the same time, the engineering is very similar. And so we will be able to leverage su substantial efficiencies there, right? Except uh, for that last one to 5%. You know, exactly. The, the pieces on top. and But yeah, that's very interesting. The basis, a lot of that can be just in a venture studio you share 
part of the accounting, you share a lot of the back end stuff. You can actually share a lot of the engineering stuff as well. I never thought about that. And and like, uh, yeah, a, a big part of it is like the, the way I look at kind of everything is like, all right, like this is an experiment. We're going to try to create the next generation of ag equipment companies. And we might sprinkle in a couple of software companies in there, but for the most part, our focus is on accomplishing that. And the the model just follows that goal, right? And so how many are you targeting? Are you targeting how many are you planning to build? And and where are you now? Let's say we're at the end of the summer in the Northern Hemisphere, um, in 2022, the end of August. What what is the current um, the current status? So we're super early stage. I'm also going to be uh, somewhat vague here to avoid any SEC challenges. Um, but we we are we have basically one company that is being that is transferred into the portfolio. Um, we are building the rest of the project here and we'll have more announcements to follow hopefully later this year, but, you know, realistically, possibly in early 2023. And and what are like exciting sectors? Like what is like having been building one and, and getting close to some others, what are some very overlooked pieces like table grapes for sure. Probably it's the first time we ever discuss it on, on this, this podcast, but what are other, um, Let's even say subsectors, but other pieces you, you really get excited about and almost wish there would be more, if you're building a company in that space, more competitors. Like what are you uh, excited about in that um, collaborative automation space? Um, I think, honestly, there's not very, the other, I guess this is the other reason why the studio, I don't see that many early stage companies right now externally that are super exciting um, because everyone is chasing venture dollars because that's what's available for the most part. Um, there are exceptions. Like you look at like Gus spraying. I think that's a really cool company. Um, uh, how are they called? What are uh, they Gus mean? automation, I believe like um, Gus spraying or Gus automation, but basically they built autonomous spray spraying robots um, for specialty crops. I believe they're based in California, central Valley, California. Um, and, and I don't know them really beyond watching a lot of videos on YouTube but they were born out of a spraying services provider, right? So they just solved their own problem. And it turns out that now, instead of having to have people drive tractors with the sprayers on the back, they can watch their robot do it. Um, so, so you're saying the model of investing, the VC model is actually prohibiting to see more innovation, more in, especially in the specialty crops. Because the addressable market, like what we discussed before, like it's easier to invest somewhere else. Is that what you're like? It's missing yeah, innovation it, there it, because it the I'm funding saying. isn't there. Yeah, the funding's kind of not there, and I think, yeah, because when you go through like a quick exercise that says, okay, well, how big can my addressable market be? You cut you you actually kind of have to cut most specialty crop things. The other really big because you're not working on soy and and like the big acreage where you can do that where you can do that that calculation very easily. Look, we have so many millions of acres we can go. If we only capture zero point one percent, then we are are all going to be rich. Yes. Uh, Although one thing that I do think is actually and and that is really relevant to the soil side of things that I think is under thought about but is exciting in specialty crop world is car. I'm this is like a real wormhole, but is carbon monitoring. Um, it's my belief, this is a hot take, that it's not technically and economically feasible to measure soil organic carbon via satellite data. I don't think that can be done. Uh, I We're going to get some emails. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, 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 I think you were very clear on measuring because... Measuring uh, until now, I haven't seen anything yet. The modeling, yeah, modeling is, is another sure. thing, but accuracy is the issue. Let's yeah. say yeah. I could I, honestly, Corn Saves America, great podcast by Ag Economic Insights, would recommend um, if you want to like really deep dive on the uh, uh, soil carbon thing as compared to ethanol markets. It's it's real nerdy, um, but but and so without getting too in the weeds there. I, But there's a solution to that. I think the solution is what we should be measuring. And the thing that we really care about here is the actual atmospheric flux. 
of carbon dioxide and methane or methane for, for the Europeans out there. Um, but um, it's funny, I've, I've started to say methane more often than methane. Um, <laughs> I don't even know what I say. Uh, I'm gonna get emails about that as well. Um, but Do you mean like the, the, the flux above the fields? Exactly, above our... exactly, because that enables you to account for, and again, like measurement is better than modeling. And because no modeling yeah. leads to all sorts of challenges, I'll just keep it short there. Yeah. Um, but it, it really leads to a lot of challenges. Um, and this, uh, you can do this remotely, like measuring the the flux of these emissions or these gases we would like to yeah. measure. Yeah. Because then we, you could almost see the fields breathe, basically. If you're, you're yeah, exactly. That, that's what exactly. you would like to that's see. The, that's right. And it's all correlated, right? You do need to understand soil organic carbon and all sorts of other nutrients in the soil and the biology of the soil, actually. Because so I'm thinking about this from like a soil triangle pyramid standpoint. You've got chemical and physical. Biological is the other part that is the future of soil testing. That also can't be done totally remotely. You're going to have to you're going to have to get dirty at some point is what I'm saying. Um, to dig a hole at some point. Yeah. Um, can that get a lot cheaper? Absolutely. Like, our, like super interesting space. But what I'm saying is from a, from a specialty crop and actually from a livestock standpoint, I would really like for us to move toward, move the conversation towards atmospheric monitoring. Because again, ultimately, like when we talk about climate change and reaching, we care about what's goals, up there. Yeah. Exactly. That's what matters. And if we can measure it, why the heck don't we? Because now we can account for above ground biomass above ground cow burps, whatever. And the thing that we don't even know is emitting something because we're not even paying attention to it. Um, so yeah, that is possible. Uh, there, I, I work with the Yield Lab Europe as well, which is an impact venture capital fund and they're invested in a company called Carbon Space Technology that, that does this. Um, so, so yeah, uh, that, that, that I think is a really interesting opportunity that isn't in, I think that permanent and specialty crops don't get nearly as much love because it's a small, you know, it's because for good reasons, they're complicated, but they're also like a more promising opportunity and they're just kind of better to grow from a net benefit standpoint, right? Trees and perennials generally better from Health. a carbon yeah. standpoint. And fruits and vegetables generally better than corn. And the potential is just enormous if you look at. I just watched a video just before we started actually on, on like extreme pruning, obviously on a very small scale agroforestry models, like the centropic side of things. Like the, the possibilities there are immense. The labor challenges are immense as well. And, and there, there is some kind of sweet spot there to make it maybe slight. I'm going to get emails for sure. Slightly less complicated or complex. And, but still what, what kind of automation we can collaborative automation, because you're going to need, you're never going to automate uh, a centropic agroforestry, um, uh, plot, I think with 20 different types that need to be pruning it. Like you need, but you also need a lot of people to, to, to have some kind of augmented help there to, to do it. And, and the, the, like, there's so much potential in perennials that we are not tapping into, probably rightfully so, like you said, because there are a few gurus that are really good at it and, and then a few other people. But if you count them, there are probably a few thousand and that's it. That's never going to be enough to manage millions of actors. So where is that technology piece and what's being designed there to, to make those systems even possible at, at slightly larger scale than we're currently do? Well, and I think the way that we actually get there, because, yeah, all you said is true and I can think of a bunch of examples too of like, I'm like, oh, that's like, that's never going to work on a, on a spreadsheet. Um, but the way we can get there is by stopping, uh, stop, we have to stop thinking about labor is unskilled. There's no such thing really one. Um, and it's insulting. Um, but there's, if you flip that, you've got farming as a service and kind of uh, crop management services that exist today. You've got like, there's all sorts of um, services like this in row cropping, like the, the guy who manages my family's land does this across different farms in Iowa today, um, right? He's a service provider and he's really good at it. He's a good farmer. <laughs> he knows his stuff and he treats his clients well. Shift that then to specialty crops. And again, right now, the people who are doing the work are very undervalued. And if we could just shift the narrative a little bit 
such that we said, you know what? These guys are experts. We have a hazelnut orchard planting crew. They will tell you exactly what it will cost in this region to implement a hazel, because you only plant a hazelnut orchard once, right? And so you're not very good at it. You're not very efficient. You're never going to be very good at it. Outsource it. It makes way more sense from a land management standpoint to do that. And bring in all the knowledge over decades build exactly. up and all the latest papers and peer reviewed exactly. stuff that only the real geeks will read or the latest courses. And, and like, uh, yeah, you're right. The perennial one, you do once or a few times, maybe, and, and you will never reach full capacity or full potential there because yeah, you don't do it daily. You don't learn daily. You don't focus daily on, on these kind of systems. Right. So can you get to a future state where these crews are providing services to farms? Because like this is the way that row crops work right now from an input standpoint, right? You've got crop consultants. They tell you what to do. You don't really have to overthink it. It's You're doing what your input provider tells you to do. And right now in row crops, what's the sales channel for most technology? Input providers. In specialty crops, though, you're still going direct to farmer for the most part. Maybe input providers if you're dealing with irrigation and also some chemical stuff. But from a labor standpoint, you're going direct to farmers and you should be going actually to the labor provider. But the challenge is that that system is so broken right now, it's it's really hard to get there. But I absolutely can envision a future world where a lot of the services that like in the U.S. we have an extension service, right? And so that provides some of these services. It's definitely variable um, depending on where you are and what crop we're talking about. And it's hard to bring in new crops through this system. But, you know, it's it's something it's, it, it does. It provides a lot of value. Um, if you can kind of put some of that expertise into a specialized farm labor workforce and that farm labor workforce then becomes your sales channel and in fact your customer for the next generation of ag equipment companies then you can actually start to have an experimental group within that workforce that says hey you want to i don't know do all sorts of funky integrated multi-row planting systems we'll we'll try that with you we'll budget it out for you We'll say, here's what it will cost for us to implement this system. Do you want to do it? And we'll, we'll, we'll be there to do it for you, which solves for the major labor risk. It doesn't solve for all the risks, to be very clear, because there's also the supply chain market risk, like implementing new crops, even, you know, like a new crop for that region or for that farm is super hard to do. But it's impossible to do if we don't solve for this labor issue. And, and so why now, mostly from, let's say, from an engineering or technology piece, because the labor issue, it's clear, why not? It's only getting worse. We have to fix it, preferably yesterday, which we didn't. And, and But why now? Let's, let's ask the investor question. Why is this so exciting now and uh, not only so relevant, but so exciting now from a, from a building perspective and also from an investment perspective? Maybe not from the VC yet, but or maybe that will never come, but from, from an investor and, and studio model, why, why is the time now? Well, okay, first I'm going to say it, it, the VC opportunity is there for some companies, not all companies. To, like That's how I would view it. And again, it depends on your fund model and how you're thinking about returns, because I think you can make it work. Um, the time is now from a technology standpoint, the positive side and the negative side. So positive side, there has been so much progress in automation and robotics autonomy at this point is can be delivered functionally as a service it's it's the bare minimum it's not that expensive to do anymore if you do it intelligently there are lots of off-the-shelf robots we're starting to see fleet robots start to be functional and so we're starting to see technology proof points and when you look at other industries there are very expensive ver expensive versions of the types of technologies we want to see, whether that's end effectors, whether that's vision, et cetera, that can be basically stripped down and re-engineered for agricultural applications. So both hardened for outdoor, you know, for outdoor weather applications and made minimalist because we are not dealing with iPhones, we're dealing with blueberries, right? Um, 
And then on the negative side of that, though, because I, I think that a lot of investors and technologists are seeing that, are seeing that that opportunity is there to apply technology that is relatively mature from a, a, a technology risk standpoint to agricultural applications. However, I fear that some of those tech, most of those technologists actually have a, a limited understanding of agricultural systems. And so two things, uh, two things that I'm currently worried about probably could generate a longer list here. Um, <laughs> but one, they're, they're going to be disappointed because they're going to invest in things that take too long to deliver returns or never deliver returns because they're not understanding how to sell to their market over the right time frame. Um, and they don't have a realistic exit opportunity. And then secondly, from a more you know, big picture standpoint, when we start to invest in fully autonomous systems, for monoculture cropping systems, it becomes even harder to diversify those systems. So when you look at all of the strawberry harvesters out there, many of which are super interesting, it is a very real problem and it needs solving, but they are addressing, so specifically in the US, you look at like Harvest Crew and you look at Tortuga um, and I'm forgetting one, but I'm sorry to the one I'm forgetting, but like those are all really technically interesting and like relatively feasible things to do. But what I fear will happen from a, and, and also agricultural systems are going to be diverse, will have monoculture and that's fine, actually is my belief. Um, we need to have some of it, but it locks us in, right? So if we're only designing for the really big farms that can afford to customize their farm setup to the very big expensive machine, then we run into this like permanent factory farming system situation. And again, like we can have some of that, but we shouldn't have all of that. Um, and so that's, that's why now someone better also start pushing the narrative for alternatives to the all in one does everything for your farm type machines. But and, and and but you have to redesign your farm to fit the machine and then you'll be locked in for that for a, a long time. Yeah. That's the narrative that, that that is a bit problematic. So what would you tell to the investor side um, to of course without giving investment advice, but sort of prevent them to get disappointed? Like people are getting very excited about, of course, what technology can do. We are amazed every day getting very excited about soil and, and then sort of at that intersection, what would you tell them to be careful with, to look out for, to be get to look into maybe to get excited, obviously, especially crops, uh, but but beyond that or next set, what would you give them as sort of general uh, general advice? Two things. One, understand total addressable market and understand that the global, you know, if someone's throwing you a 1.4 trillion specialty crop market number, like uh, that's not your realistic addressable market. So really understand the kind of go-to market plan and what's realistic on a bottom-up basis. And then two, and I maybe should have flipped the order of this because I actually think the second part is more important. Who's using it? Who is using the product? Talk to them. That's, that's it's like main, that simple. It's kind one. of obvious, um, but I don't think that it's often done as part of a due diligence process for some reason. Which is in general really weird. Like yeah. I, I meet investors that invest in food that they didn't even really try. Like the bare minimum you could do is order it. Let's see if it gets to your place or wherever you can buy it. If it's a direct to consumer, and then eat it and if it's technology you figure out who ends up using it and see if they will and if they are happy or not and, right uh, if they well, are if they are in, in let's say engaged in the collaborative process or not exactly well and this becomes even more challenging i think in the in the robotics because like it's increasingly common and this is good to talk to farmers as part of a due diligence process but What's important to understand is that farmers or farm it. managers are not necessarily the user and they don't necessarily like the people who are their user. Uh, oh, so, so that creates a, a real communications challenge. And so 
I think that most people will really struggle to get access to the actual user. So talking about that with the founders and being realistic about like what, how are you, how are you trying to get access to this group of people um, matters. Matters, absolutely. And then to, to because time is flying actually, but the, what would you do, you're, you're running this experiment, let's say the studio becomes uh, a success and, and somehow you get access to you, to a significant amount of resources. I, I always like to use the 1 billion question. What would you do with that? Um, but it doesn't have to be in the studio actually. Like what if you had a billion dollars to put to work in ag and food? Let's confine it to North America. And for now, maybe you see great opportunities also in Europe, but let's say, what would you, how would you put that to work? What would you prioritize if you had that access for a very long time? It doesn't have to be a VC model. Obviously you can. You can also buy land to regenerate it if you want it and never sell it. And there have to be some kind of return model, but it could be a 50 year plan if you want to. I love this question. And I don't know if I'm taking a cop out answer or, or not, but like, I definitely am wrong about most of my guesses. I'm sure. Um, I will change in real time. Hopefully that's something I try to do forever. And there are a ton of really smart people who do not currently, and thought smart isn't even it, but thoughtful and with diverse perspectives um, who can effectively deploy capital but don't have access to it. And so if I had a billion dollars today, I would want to spend it all ASAP so that it can start to deliver returns. And the most effective way to do that, I think, would be to break it down into a bunch of different experiments run by a bunch of different people. And I think the mandate there would be to make things as kind of open sourced as possible so that we can iterate upon that set of experiment, distributed experiments. Like that's what I'm trying to do with Farmhand Ventures. We are trying, we will be as transparent as we can be about our model. We'll be able to be more transparent in a little bit, um, but because I want someone to do it better than I'm doing it, actually. And and beyond collaborative automation and, and technology, what are other pieces of the puzzle you see completely or almost completely neglected? Like, where do you get excited where, where resources are um, needed, but not being deployed at the moment and where you would be if you had access to a billion dollars? I think one other thing that would be very interesting, I think that there's really a gap between the like real estate, real asset investment managers and the tech managers. And like that needs to be bridged. Um, And like that some ideally would also be inclusive of the like existing land owners. And like, I think about this a lot. I was just with my grandma who, you know, we passively manage our farmland and it's, it's fascinating scenario. Um, <laughs> but, but like, I would like for those groups to be more interrelated. One way I could see one interesting, like capital structure to do that in my mind would be kind of like a retrofit farm type fund model. So a situation where, and these exist for, um, I wish I could remember the name of this fund, but there, there's a couple of funds like this that exist for like apartment buildings. So where a, uh, you basically provide financing such that the landlord can increase insulation, you know, install new windows, make the apartment more livable and increase rent slightly and also decrease uh, utility costs substantially. And so that's how that fund ends up delivering a return, right? Um, usually that's debt based. And I think a similar thing could absolutely exist for farmland and that could be tied again to the agriculture technology element of things um, and the practice side of things. Um, I think that could be super duper interesting. And I would love to see if anyone's doing it, reach out. I want to talk to you. <laughs> and scalable because it, that's especially when it gets into the debt side of things, the, the, the debt market is, is a, a number of times bigger than a lot of the other markets combined. And there's just so much money looking for these kind of things, going into real estate, going into renewable energy, going into other things that would love probably access to other real assets like, like land, not necessarily buying it, but improving it over time and getting a, an okay return out of that is, is very, very interesting because you're talking about large, uh, large quantities of money and large quantity of hectares, which means a lot of impact. And, uh, so that there we need way more experimentation. Absolutely right. But what if, now go ahead. Well, I guess the one other thing I would add that I'm like, 
what what when I look at Europe, especially, like it's very interesting to compare, contrast, well, climate smart ag in the U.S. versus, um, uh, uh, well, depends if you're in the U.K. or the rest of the EU, but uh, you know, farm to fork strategies in the EU. Um, one thing I would like to see a lot more investment in as well is really measuring emissions instead of modeling emissions on a on a policy basis because one i think that if we could get more confidence in that number there might be a little bit less controversy but more importantly actually if we could measure that number so and so specifically what i mean here you look at like the netherlands or you look at ireland in terms of like cattle culling controversies as relates to the 2030 uh, methane, you know, reduction pledge. Um, right now, we're having to meet, every nation is trying to meet these goals based off of models that are extrapolations of studies done in limited geographies with limited genetics, with limited feed input types. And it's really comparing apples to oranges and then extrapolating off of them. And while I wouldn't go, you know, we directly need to lower emissions. And so I don't want to go so far as to like say, no, 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 like cows aren't a problem. Um, but what I would like to see is a reward for the dairies that are, and the reward actually in some cases would be not a punishment, um, but a reward. Or not being for, closed. Yeah. Right. Not being, yeah. Not having to call your cattle. Um, but a reward for adopting a new manure digester that reduces your, or a feed additive that reduces your emissions, right? And right now, we don't have the infrastructure in place to enable that on a, on a legislative basis. Um, so I would love to see more investment on that front. Um, but it's, that's a tricky one. It's a tricky one because, I mean, I continue to see these charts of I think our world in data and, and things like that showing the immense emissions from from livestock. And I think the listener of the show, Erov, has, has always replied to that in on LinkedIn, constantly taking apart the LCAs underneath there and the models underneath there, which are let's say imprecise by best and probably flawed completely if you look at them. Like it's not it's much more nuanced than that. And the issue is that they're being used for all kinds of legislative stuff across the EU and across the world, which doesn't really hold any, any ground. Like the underlying assumptions there are very, very risky. doesn't mean we shouldn't address the methane problem and, and all of it, but it's very tricky to do that. And it's very tricky because you're punishing a lot of people that have made massive changes in their, in their practices. And, and we just throw out the cow with all the issues and not, not really, not really addressing the underlying issues, which probably issue because they're all inside and eating a corn and soy all day and they, there's there's an underlying issue there that that is very tricky doesn't mean we have to uh, don't have to reduce the amount of livestock in the netherlands um but the underlying questions are not asked and completely being relying on those models except for measuring actually like the the above field um levels that you mentioned before that would be super interesting because then you can see actually like okay what's the actual emission like and what how does it fluctuate over year and how does it fluctuate over different pastures how does it fluctuate over xyz and we have no idea now i still like all of this data comes from closed environments which by definition doesn't really represent the outside environment so we have sort of yeah maybe some of them i think gets absorbed immediately by bacteria have we any like, any clue no not really because there's no there's no data right yeah, no, it, well, and especially and like, and, and like the positive side is that for like for the regenerative movement, right? Or or organic, which maybe go and invest in that from. stuff, and you gotta and, prove it. And proof, proof that you're way like a three x, ten x, whatever the x is, better, or even ten yeah. percent, and yeah. and show like, look, it's not the same product. It's not the same. Like we're now doing with nutrient density, like it's not the same. It's not the same tomato. It's not the same piece of beef. It's not like it, you cannot call it the same because it's off the charts different in terms of certain phytonutrients that you need. Maybe it's off the charts different in sort of, sort of in, in a number of, of emissions, but we don't know because we took one study somewhere and we extrapolated for basically the all of you and then said, no, you have to reduce in this, this, and this. 
which is risky. No, it's but yeah, what's the business model of measurement? Uh, very, very difficult to invest in that and to to get that going. Um, but very, very needed. So completely neglected. I would yeah would would keep a piece of that billion to to invest in those because potentially it's the highest potential outcome or positive outcome you can you can get by simply showing what's currently what's currently happening. Right, because they can drive everything else forward theoretically. But yeah, there's there's a lot of political uh, complications. <laughs> of course, because we're, we're on a certain track. And um, so, what would you change if you had one? If you had a magic wand, I mean, you know this question is coming. Um, and you could change one thing in ag and food. What would that be? I actually think it's that. I mean, yeah, the, maybe I skipped a step there, but uh, yeah, I I like to measure everything. Um, I think that being able now, like it's unrealistic, right? Most people don't actually want to get into the weeds of the different numbers and the different kind of optimization models. Um, but I do. And if you could do that in an affordable way, I think it can unlock almost everything that we've talked about and, and then some kind of, but I don't, I, I also don't know that it's feasible, right? Like this goes all the way back to, um, with like the Yield Lab Institute work that I've done, like when I, I so we at the, so the Yield Lab Institute is uh, the nonprofit branch of the Yield Lab family of funds. Um, and it was initially start, I started it initially because I wanted to try to quantify impact across an early stage venture capital agri-food tech fund portfolio. I don't think you can do that actually, authentically. any Like, I don't think that's really possible. The more you dig into it, the more you try to force quantification on it, um, or the more I dug into it and tried to do that, I realized uh, I feel like there's going to be double and triple accounting here, and it's inauthentic. And so it's better just to say, we'll only invest if it has a binary positive or negative <laughs> impact, and we'll just have to leave it at that. And that's going to have to be good enough, actually, for an impact venture capital fund. Um, with with some reporting and continuing to monitor that, uh, but but yeah, so so I say I say I wish we could quantify everything with the caveat that I might be wrong that it's the best thing to do. But would you would it or is it possible on a on a farm level or field level? Like on, on I imagine like a few layers away. Okay, but to to be able to start getting real data from. A field, it could be an orchard, could be whatever table grapes, could be like, are we getting any close to to getting? Not, I'm not even saying real time because it would be amazing, but like proper data um, with an okay sense of ac accuracy that we can actually compare and start looking at. Okay, this this is just a better way of doing this, or it's a more positive way because of this, this, and this. Like, do we get anywhere, or is that a sort of a pipe dream? Do you mean from do you mean from like an externality variable? Yeah, like thing? even just the emission the emission yeah. side, like you mentioned, this yeah. is possible now. Is that how accurate do we get in a sense? Can we compare hectares yeah. to hectares, or is it more of regional? Today in Western Europe and most of North America and increasingly Latin America, you can measure every roughly five weeks the flux, so the change in atmospheric carbon dioxide. Um, and you can do that on a field by field basis that can get better when we, as more satellites get launched. Um, I think the other really important thing that we haven't talked about is water. I'd argue it might be more important than the CO2 thing actually. And then also nitrous oxide. Um, and yeah, you can, you cannot, the challenge with the water thing is evapotranspiration stuff is only valuable to agronomics if you can get it like really more than daily actually uh -uh. and you can't do that right now but i am aware of a couple companies working on launching new satellites to enable that so i think we can get there um but that again that enable... runs into the problem of like yeah. but you know we're measuring we're measuring these like nerdy science th concepts actually and like, How does again, it I suspect into something? what might matter yeah. more is the people. And so that's yeah. where I'm like, you know, the, the science geek in me wants to do all of that. And I wonder if that could have adverse, con I'd want to think through the consequences of that. Although I think we ultimately are moving towards doing that regardless. Um, yeah, no, it's very interesting to think about what that would lead to if we 
are are daily able to to measure water and, and emissions, etc. What would that what would that give us? Like we okay, we know a lot more, and now what do we do with that? Or and how it do we raises enforce super, anything. Sorry, yeah, it, it raises. No, no, and super, it raises. Super, go ahead. It raises super interesting questions about data ownership, um, like farm data ownership, because yeah, the the there's been a lot of interesting content on this. And I've done a lot of work on this with the Ag Launch Group, but like, yeah, it it just raises questions when you can suddenly get all the data you need just off Google Earth. That's part for a, that's that's going to be part of a whole different podcast. And <laughs> until then, um, I would like to thank you so much for for your time today to to unpack some of it. I, I have the feeling we only scratched the surface, but that's probably probably a good thing, which means we're going to check in again. And I want to thank you so much for, of course, the work you do and for coming on here to share about them. Yeah, thank you for having me, Kuhn. It was lots of fun and happy happy to chat anytime. Thank you so much for listening all the way to the end. For the show notes and links discussed, check out our website, investinginregenerativeagriculture.com forward slash post. Thank you so much for listening all the way to the end. For the show notes and links we discussed in this episode, check out our website, investinginregenerativeagriculture.com forward slash posts. If you liked this episode, why not share it with a friend or give us a rating on Apple Podcasts? That really helps. Thanks again and see you next time.